welcome into your Friday edition of RFK Refugees. I'm your host, John, and we have with us second time guest, Paige Mateer of the Washington Spirit. Paige, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, uh, I I grabbed Sam on the way out and said I have to have Paige this week because this game this game this weekend was crazy. I had you. They don't ask us for our players of the match. No one cares. I, you were mine, and then I found out that the Spirit Squadron gave you one as well, uh, and it was exceedingly deserved in a game where you know the Spirit went four to one against the second at the at the time the second highest team in the league who had been really hard to beat. Uh, for my for my eyes, you were the most impactful player on the entire field, playing in a new position. So I'm really happy to have you on this week. Let's let's jump right into this last weekend and how this started. Um, so for those who did not watch the game somehow and are watching listening to this podcast for some reason, you skipped the good part and you got to the you got to this. Uh, Paige started right back uh, at this game. This was not your first time, right? You played in the game in Richmond. You played there as well, right? Yeah, and the Arsenal scrimmage. Which was an interesting one to start a new position. Right. Yeah, no, we'll throw you into the fire there. Yeah. How, when did this conversation uh start and did it did it well just that's the question. When did it start? Yeah, I would say pretty much all year I've been kind of used in different positions. I think a lot of our team is. Yeah. We constantly are splitting into different places and different drills. So I think it was just kind of I got a lot of reps in the back line and more at center back or some at outside back. And I think the Chicago game, we were just really low on defenders and they were like, all right, well, she's done it at training. So let's just see how this goes. But I think it's just a testament to one, the way we train with a lot of flexibility and two, just the willingness of our team to adapt. Yeah. How, how usually gets thrown back there in a pinch in a red card situation. So I think, <laughs> I think you win on the, how about you start there and know you're going to start there versus a uh, surprise. How, how did you feel the season had gone so far? So you, like you said, you had a lot of flexibility and, and from a tactical standpoint, but also you had the reps, so it wasn't something completely foreign to you. Uh, and I'm sure you've done it in, in your career in the past, but like, how had you felt the season had gone so far before that? So you had you had gotten, uh, I would say, s- spot start duty on occasions when there's been when when Hal or Andy were out that you would get you would go to your normal position that you'd played so far for the Spirit. How did you feel the season had gone for you so far? Um, just in, you know, how would you have assessed your year so far? Yeah, I think it's always interesting starting with a different role and a different style of play. And I think we have so much depth in the midfield, as you've seen. Courtney's yeah. gotten great minutes there. Heather's gotten great minutes. Andy and Hal are amazing. So it's just been a very different environment compared to those that I've previously been in. So couple that with the change of play that we've seen with Jonah and Adrian. I think it's just been like a whole new learning experience this year. And I was really grateful to get the opportunity to learn from those in the midfield, but obviously now learning from the back line as well. There's, you have a lot of uh, people that you could lean on. Anna would be one. There's so many, the conversion, the midfield to right back or left back pipeline is long in DC soccer on the men's and the women's side. It just seems like that's the, that's the way that goes. But uh, I want to talk about how, comfortable and and at ease you looked from that position we could talk about the goal the goal is probably the thing that people are most gonna gonna look at because you carried the ball most of the field uh and, and cut in and made a and really kind of a great shot that kind of caught the French flat-footed uh did you feel as comfortable as you looked the entire game does it did it just seem like this was this was natural and it was because it wasn't like you were playing a a you know, the bottom of the league, you were playing a very, very challenging uh, opponent. Yeah, I think being in a new situation, and it's kind of the same thing that I experienced getting thrown into a starting role last year, where when you enter a new situation, it's like you have all these expectations, but at the same time you don't because you've never done it before. Right. So I feel like that kind of helps ease the mind a little bit of like, you know, you're just, you're doing your best effort. Like this is something new and you're learning along the way. And it kind of takes the pressure off of like expectations. So I feel like that's kind of refreshing being in a new role and, you know, being able to handle it that way and kind of seeing it from a different perspective. And I honestly think that's going to help translate whether I ever like any role on the field, Mm -hmm. just being able to experience something new and kind of, it just changes your perspective. I love the, flexibility the team gets having someone that can carry the ball as well as you can and as as quickly as you can and also to your comfort in dribbling out of problems 
which I think is really good for this team because it's all been it's all been about sort of you know obviously play out of the back has been has been part of that possession has been part of that and flexibility and being able being able to be comfortable in any situation. Um, but I think I think that being able to absorb some forward pressure from the opponent and then draw them out of the way by dribbling past them and then breaking that first line, I think is going to be a real attribute for this team going forward. If that's going to be sort of your, your position there, I think not that, you know, I think that Casey's been doing that. Gabby's done that at times to the season, Kate, when she's healthy. Um, but I think it's, it seems like your skill set there is going to be an interesting unlock. If that's, you know, going forward where Jonah wants to deploy you for the most part, that's smart. Yeah. At least on my take in it. <laughs> yeah. I would say even if you just watch her back line, like, that's something Tara's really good at sometimes when she just invites pressure in and easy finds a pass to the midfield or just escapes it that way. I think seeing how comfortable our back line is on the ball, it kind of helps you feel more relaxed at the same time because it feels like no one's panicking. If that makes sense. I want to give a chance to, for uh, some, a player that didn't get, I think enough credit from last week's game. I want to hear your thoughts on Anna Butel, how well she handled uh, really, really, aggressive and, 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 and powerful attack. I felt like she, uh, Tamwa just was obviously she scored. And I think the goal probably was on a, a play that Anna would have liked to have back. I think she lost her balance a little bit on, but for the rest of the game, she was in her pocket. She was like, it was like mind game. She caused her to push her. Like it was like, she was, she was there the whole game. I just wanted to, from where you were sitting, did she look like she had her in hand, like the whole, the whole match. Yeah, I think our back line did a great job of handling that. And obviously that's something that we're going to focus on going into a weekend and going against an opponent like that. But I think just overall, Ana Yig's like pretty sneaky the way she plays. Like you kind of won't expect in that time she's dribbling out of pressure. She's bumping runners. She's like cutting off angles. She's very smart on the way that she defends players. And I think that was a great showing for her to show you guys what we see every day at practice. Yeah. I think I just want to make sure she got some flowers because she yeah. did really, really well on, on, a, on an overall defensive, you know, clinic, I would say. Were there any surprises for you from the midweek? It doesn't look like there was from the midweek to when the actual match was how Kansas city came out. Were there any sort of uh, wrinkles that you did not expect um, as, as that came to game day? Yeah, I think positionally, like we kind of understood their game. I don't think we, I mean, this might be a bad say, but I don't think we probably expected to go that well. Just being able to finish two goals in the first few yeah. minutes really helps and it kind of alters other opponents' game plan and how they feel on the ball. But yeah, I would say we knew the general shape they were going to have. I think they rotated a lot more and there were some, you know, tricky things to solve in the back line there with midfielders rolling out, forwards going high, outside backs going high, things like that. But I think we did a decent job preparing for however they may come. Uh, you've gotten a chance to see now, obviously on the field this last weekend, most of the new players on the field and in training, you've seen them all. Uh, what are you seeing Rose and Lacey bring to the attack, uh, that's new? And then also what have you seen from Esme in training as far as what, what she's going to, how she's going to change the back line? Yeah, I think Rose and Lacey, especially they are, cause they're attackers. I'm going against some more, I would say, right. but they're such interesting players in the sense, like, they really do bring something new. I said it before, but the whole first week Rose was here, she would cut back on all of us. Like every time we try to block a shot or something, she would just cut us and have a free shot. And that was something to get used to, but it's definitely going to make us so much better as a team. And same with Lacey, the way she, she's very smart in the pocket she finds, but also the way she moves with the ball helps. But I think she gets not enough credit for the way she moves off the ball as well. And then Esme is just obviously a great, great defender. Yeah, as you said, we haven't seen her as much, but hopefully she'll be, you know, up to speed soon and feeling better. But yeah, she's been a great addition as well. It's funny that you mentioned that about Rose and her cutback. Like, I think that's the first thing she did on the field was draw a yellow card after she did that. So clearly that's the move. Clearly that's that's one of the things she can do. Um, Let's take a step. Why? I guess I do want to ask you sort of, uh, you've had an interesting pathway. We talked about it last time you were on the show from undrafted to every week starter to rookie of the month to all of the accolades sort of that, that followed you. And now, and now you're in year two. What are the biggest changes you're seeing in yourself uh, with the benefit of having had that first year in your pocket versus sort of the on everything being unexpected. You still had change because you got a new coach, never a new position and all the things that spirits, the spirit way is to have uh, 
some new, some new, some new exciting things to to work with from year to year. But what do you see the biggest changes in yourself coming into or go you know midway through the second year? Yeah, I think as a rookie, like Lena and I talk about this a lot. It's been kind of a whole different experience. I know, as you mentioned, there's tons of new changes and things happening. But having that first year under the belt and kind of being like, okay, I already did it once. Like, I know what this is about. I know the players I'm going against. I know how it's going to feel on the field. It really does help. And, you know, I think our team's just so great this year. We're all very comfortable with each other. And I think that comfort translates to on the field as well. And the way we're being coached this year as well is just like a level of comfort, I would say, which is a nice, a nice. I think too, like it's, I could see the comfort, but I can also see like the, the really high levels of expectations from both Adrian and Jonah. Like I, you, you hear them after games and they can easily identify what needs to get better. Even in a four one, like yeah. you could tell that there was a, there was a period in the first half that really bothered him. And I bet you guys heard about it. Like I bet that it was certainly covered, but I, you know, not to say that previous coaches did not have high expectations because clearly they did. Obviously that's the case, but it seems like, you know, Jonah's coming in saying I came here to suffer uh, in La Liga, it was basically like I was expected to win all the time, and I did, and I and I won the Champions League, and that was great. But here, from a week to week, I know that I'm here to suffer. But he also wants to win every single game, no matter what. So I think that I imagine those expectations are being are well received in a really, really talented and competitive group. Yeah, exactly. It's a comfort, but it's also striving to be better. It's not like complacency, if that makes sense. It's a comfort in growing. Uh, I wanted to, we got a question about this, uh, at the presser at the end of the game uh, last week, but I want to talk about the CBA, uh, particularly from your perspective of the two things that I think, obviously the salaries increasing are good. I think it should be more. Everyone thinks it should be more, but it's good that it's, that's tacked up over time. Um, but the draft and the free agent changes, I think are probably the most impactful and sort of, uh, are making the biggest waves in the American sports market in general, I think, cause they're somewhat trend setting, at least on the draft side. What do you think uh is gonna be the advantage to players not having that draft? So you you had an experience where you didn't go through the draft. You went you were a non drafted free agent, but like as far as you see how the rest of the league is going and talk to players that have been drafted, what do you think is going to change uh both from like a player's perspective, but also from your from your angle, like how are teams going to handle this? Uh yeah. <laughs> it's different. Yeah. Yeah, I do think just in general, I think our league is in such an interesting spot having to deal with like the American infrastructure of how professional sports work here, but also all of the pressure from such a global game. And I think that's a very unique spot to be in considering most major American sports leagues don't have that outside pressure and not at the same level that we do. So the no draft thing, obviously European influence there. But I do think it's funny because, as you mentioned, a lot of people were like, oh, like, how would that work? How would that work? You know, friends from home, friends from college. And I'm like, honestly, it's kind of just what I did. And I'm grateful that I was able to, you know, take things into my own hands and choose the team I wanted to be at. And some people might even consider that like a little more of an advantage if you come later in the draft, being able to or going undrafted, being able to have that freedom to choose. So I do think it's interesting giving all the players the opportunity. I'm really grateful for that. I think that's a great idea, but I do think it'll be interesting how it plays out and how that changes, you know, the college game as well. Yeah, it's going to change the college game. I think it's going to be really interesting to see where the leverage falls. I think probably in the top, like your top five or 10 players that were likely to go in the draft are going to have a lot more leverage as far as what they're signing at, where they're signing. But I'm curious too how it's going to affect markets that are somewhat less desirable. Yeah. You know, like or an expan an expansion team, maybe you're you're gonna potentially avoid going there until they get their stuff in order. You don't necessarily want to go. So it, it'll be really interesting from a fan perspective, but also from a player's perspective to see how it goes. And there's gonna have to be a lot. I'm wondering if there's gonna have to be there's probably not gonna have to be any more scouting. The college game is already well scouted by the by the teams that do it well. So, but it's gonna just gonna be interesting. And the free agent changes too. Mm -hmm. So tell me if you tell me if this is my theory <laughs> that. The Spirit has spent all this money off the field in the last two years in player performance, in facilities to some degree. That's still, I think that's still an on, uh, you know, a shoe to drop. I know that uh, Michelle is still trying to find a place to build, but there's a place. It's certainly, it's better than where you guys were beforehand, which was like sometimes a high school field during the middle of the week and it was changing every week. And now you know where you're going to be. But they've spent all this money to try to make the, make it a more attractive, 
landing spot. And before this, that only mattered for international players. Like it wasn't really going to make a difference for those first year players. You had to have all the draft assets to, you just got them to come there because you have the assets. I feel like with the number of players entering free agency, probably, I don't know, tripling, quadrupling every single year now, that the spirit find themselves in a unique circumstance where they've got a, the most well, well-known coach in the world in the women's game. They've got the most well-known owner in the league. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe you could say angel cities since they're part owned by like Disney, basically that, that they may be a little bit more well-known, but you've got that. And then all that off the field spend that they are in a really good position to have their pick of, of potential free agents. You feel like, you're like I mean, you're there, so obviously you're going to say it's a great place to be. But I I feel like as you're as you're shopping for teams, other than like fit and opportunity, it seems like a good place to be, and it seems like this will put them in a good spot. Yeah, I think it's definitely anything that forces teams to really compete and put in more resources and become desirable. I think that's a good thing for the league, just in terms of growing. But obviously, at the spirit, as you mentioned, like Michelle's vision, you know, Jonah, Don, John Scott. Don Scott, you know, all the people we have surrounded by us every day, I think is, you know, as you said, like such an advantage. And I think it is desirable place to be. And obviously I'm just super grateful that I've ended up here and been able to experience this and learn from them. So I think you guys are getting on a plane tomorrow to go down to San Diego uh, this weekend. Uh, what, uh, what, what should we expect here? And obviously San Diego is in kind of a weird spot. They're in a bit of a transition it's better, better them than you guys this year. It's like finally somebody else having uh, some, some mid season coaching changes. So what are, you know, what are you guys expecting from a tactical perspective? Obviously they've got some talented attacking players, but they're in a bit of a in-between spot at the moment. What are you guys, what are you guys seeing? Yeah, I think obviously their record probably doesn't show all the changes they've been through this year. And I think they've added quite a few very talented players recently obviously a coaching change. So it makes it a little more unpredictable, but I think it'll be a good matchup. And I don't know if we've won at San Diego recently. So hopefully we can get a win there. Yeah. I think, I think you're in a good spot too. I think you guys are trending in the right, you're certainly trending in the right direction. Um, Last question before we go. uh, Thank you for your time again. Um, As a second year, you know, DC area resident, I asked this to ask me because she's, or was it, who was it? Somebody that was really big on coffee. It might've been Hal mm-hmm. about where to go for. And I, she told me, um, what is your favorite place to eat either near the facility out in Loudon? Are you, do you stay out there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Either there or in DC, where's your, where's your favorite spot to be from a food yeah. perspective? Um, I've, we've talked a lot about sushi race recently and there's this place called, sorry, there's a ton of lightning going on. In That's show. okay. It's rolling in. <laughs> It'll be here next. Yeah, but uh, it was a place called Mr. Sushi, Mrs. Roll, which is kind of just, a, you know, like a small sushi place. But I would say that's my go to right now. Man, that's a, that sounds like a no frill sushi experience, but it's good. Great. Yeah, no, right. I enjoy it. All right. We'll check that out. If you're it, that's in, that's in the Loudon area. Yeah. OK, yeah. there you go. I, I'm sure they'll appreciate I'm sure they'd love the extra business. So if you're listening to this and looking for sushi out there, this is your spot. Paige, thank you for joining. If, if people want to follow you on social, I know you're on Instagram. What's your handle on there? Just my name. So I'm Paige Mateo. The easiest, the easiest possible outcome. Uh, uh, thanks for listening to the show. We'll be back live now every Monday again. The the long, the, the two-week break for us is over. We're back every week now. Monday night on Twitch and YouTube and all the things at 8.30. Paige, again, thank you so much. Good luck this weekend. Uh, and for everybody else, we'll see you on Monday. Vamos. Chris, thank you.